you for being here. Um, uh, I know you're, uh, by the way, your, your bio on, uh, on, on LinkedIn is pretty sparse. You're a much more amazing person than your bio on LinkedIn. So, uh, I'm humble too. <laughs> I'm going to read the bio, <laughs> but I'm going to actually ask you to fill in the blanks. Okay? okay. It's like the bio is three sentences long and you're more interesting than that. So here's what the bio says, and then you have to fill in the blanks. Okay. Um, Dr. Uh, Andrew Aldrin is currently the director of the Aldrin Space Institute at Florida Institute of Technology. ASI is a multidisciplinary institute created to advance commercial space development. He is also the director of my school, International Space University Center for Space Entrepreneurship at Florida Tech and the Sino-US Space Policy Research Center. So please fill in the blanks because there's a lot more to it than that. Thanks okay. a lot for being here, appreciate it. Uh, okay, well, um, since I'm, used, I'm burning Greg's time, I can take as much time as I like. <laughs> no, no. So um, yeah, I, um, you know, for most of you, you, you sort of, went to the moon. And in my case, obviously, the moon came to me, you know, kind of walked in the front door when I was 11 years old, every night. So um, it's a little bit different perspective, because um, I've grown up sort of in space, people would argue as a space cadet for, you know, over 50 years now, and um, I've seen a lot happen. And now is a really exciting time. So what I'm doing right now, well, I just you know, briefly, I was, um, I actually began life as a Sovietologist and wrote my dissertation on how the Soviet Union beat the United States into space, which has some meaning because it was really a story of entrepreneurship. And fast forward to today, I'm obviously, I'm studying entrepreneurship. I'm, I, I think I'm training entrepreneurs. Um, in fact, uh, just yesterday, one of the teams that um, was created in the program, Greg is, is also a participant and sort of my co-conspirator in uh, the Center for Space Entrepreneurship, and one of our teams actually got a NASA award yesterday uh, called Eternal Light, and they are going to be sending an, ex an experiment to the moon with um, astrobotics. And for me, you know, honestly, that's just like, that's one of the coolest things that has ever happened to me, to have one of my students go into the moon. So I'm super, super stoked about that. Um, in between the sort of Sovietology and where I am today, I had you know, a career at the Rand Corporation. I was an executive at Boeing. Um, and here you've got a guy whose background is political science and business. And I was running strategy advanced programs and um, business development for Boeing's uh, NASA and their civil business. And then later for their launch business, then I went to ULA and kind of did the same thing there. And then, um, then I ran Moon Express, which is a weird wild ride uh, for about a year and then tried to retire and got pulled in by my dad into Florida Tech and, and the things you talked about. I guess what's new right now is something that is won't be public, I guess, for another month, but um, I am the um, program director of a new program at Embry-Riddle University, Embry-Riddle Worldwide. It's gonna be 100% online, uh, Masters in Space Operations. And we're gonna focus on training the world about space and, and the focus of it is really gonna be very market directed. We, we've broken it up into a series of market verticals which, where for each one of these markets, whether it's launch, comm, GPS, um, remote sensing, we break it into, you know, we talk about history, we talk about policy, we talk about technology, operations, markets a lot. And so the idea is to train them market by market rather than discipline by discipline. Super excited about that program. And then um, I just started a thing with John Wensfeen, who is running the Levan Innovation Center at Nova Southeastern University. He asked me to come in and help them set up um, a, um, a space, we call it space dock, but it's a, it's a space innovation center doing economic development. What we're trying to do is bring the Space Coast to the South, to South Florida with, with all the dynamism of entrepreneurship in South Florida and all the technology of the Space Coast. So a lot of stuff, I'm super excited about it. And, and then of course, there's the um, Aldrin Family Foundation that I run, which is really K through 12 education. And, and that's um, that's super exciting. Anyway, that those are the blanks that I could fill in, but I really wanna to get to my story because it, it follows really closely with what Laura was talking about. So let me share my screen and we'll get to that. 
All right, so um, Laura talked about private sector going to the moon and, and, and I'm very much in agreement with both Laura and Michael. The private sector isn't going there alone right now. Um, we are gonna go there in partnership with the government and we are trying to do things differently, but this isn't the first time we've tried a public-private partnership and it is gonna be a challenge. So um, in fact, I'd argue that figuring out the economics and the policy of public-private partnerships is probably gonna be more challenging than, um, than the technology. We kind of understand that, at least if we throw enough money at it, we can burn down that risk. This is a set of risks that's really different. So I just wanna start out with this statement which I didn't think was that big a deal, but I keep having my students come back to me and said, I remember you said this, and it's true. I think today we are getting closer to programs which have very little government participation, but there is still some participation. And when we talk about commercialization, there are all kinds of definitions, and Ken Davidian and I have spent literally hours talking about this stuff, and so everybody's got a perspective on it. My perspective on it, which is no better than anyone else's and probably worse than most, is risk sharing. Industry and government both have some part of the risk pie, if you will. And the degree to which government takes more risk means it is a less commercial program. The degree to which it takes less risk or industry takes more risk makes it more commercial. Sounds simple, right? It isn't, unfortunately, because the government and industry have different profiles on risk. Right, government is worried about budgetary risk. They're worried about performance risk. Industry is fairly simple. There are two risks that industry worries about. It's cost risk and revenue risk. And so if those are gonna be kind of the terms that I'm gonna to use to talk about this in the next few minutes here. Um, and so now I'm gonna start with my cool graphic. Um, I call it the chasm of risk because you got, you got a guy here with money. Hey, that well, wait a minute, that's my dad. Um, I didn't know he had that money. Um, you got a guy here with money and he wants to buy fuel on the moon. And the, the, the thing which is in between the two is, is, a, is a huge chasm of risk. And it's technical risk, it's financial risk, it's policy risk, it's political risk, it's all kinds of different risks, but we got to cross that. And, and it's worth having a conversation about that. Um, you know, one of the things is, I talked about industry and government risk and that they have different perspectives on it, right? Industry is worried about cost and revenue risk. Government is worried about performance. Is the contractor that they deal with, are they going to be able to deliver service they have promised to the American people? And budget risk, it's cost is more a function of budget than it is of actual cost. Because if they get the money appropriated and enacted in a budget, they don't care, they're, they're gonna spend it all, right? Their incentive is to spend it all. But once you bust that budget, then you got a problem, okay? And so we've done this before, and this is by no means a comprehensive look. I just picked a few interesting examples in the past. So let's start with X33. So the way to kind of look at this chart, obviously red is high risk, government risk, high industry risk, green is good. As you go further from here out here, the scale of the risk grows. Okay, so the X33, wonderful idea. Really cool, right? We're gonna, it was a prototype to a single stage to orbit vehicle, which proved to be impossible technically. The basic deal, but he, somehow or another, Elon's gonna figure it out. That I don't, I don't know that, but at any rate, the basic deal was government, NASA gave, gave Lockheed, I think, about a billion dollars to do a prototype. Anything over and above that, which they knew was going to be considerable, was up to Lockheed. But Lockheed took on a lot of risk. And the government, at the same time, kind of took on some risk as well. But anyway, what it ended up happening was technically it proved to be too challenging. Lockheed started losing a lot of money on it. They didn't see that it was, it was going to work out. And they bailed out, which cut their risk off. Right. The guy, it, it, it left the government kind of holding an empty pail. But so the X-33 program didn't really work out. In my opinion, it didn't work out because they put too much risk on industry. And when industry industry will get out of the program when it becomes too risky most of the time. So EELV, personal favorite of mine, because I lived through this pain. Thankfully, when I came to Boeing, 
the I was not part of the launch business unit. But in this particular case, Boeing and Lockheed took on an extraordinary amount of mostly, mostly revenue risk. I mean, they took on some cost risk, but we knew how to build launch vehicles. That wasn't going to be the real challenge. The real challenge was, can you make money in this? And in order to make money, you had to sell lots and lots of launches. And remember, this was in the time of what I call the second wave of commercialization, when we were literally going to darken the sky with satellites. Of course, then it only took 1,000 satellites to darken the sky. Now it's going to take 40,000. But that was the story. And what happened? You know, Boeing had a manifest of 40 launches a year. Turned out to be four. It kind of sounds like the shuttle, doesn't it? Doesn't it? When we originally launched the, started the shuttle program, we thought the shuttle was going to cost $8 million a launch. $8 million. Right. We missed that one by a little bit. Um, anyway, so industry took on a lot of risk and they failed. And industry came to government and said, we're losing here. We, we can't afford to stay in this business. And, and the Department of Defense said, no, guys, this isn't like NASA and X-33. You can't bail out of this program. But what we will do is we'll restructure the program so that we'll reduce. We will accept more risk in this program. And, and we will make you financially solvent from this point on, but you, you've already written off your $2 billion, the piece, um, and, and you're gonna stick, you, you're stuck with those risks. And so we ended up with a program that was called EELV by three, in which the government absorbed a lot of risk. I would argue almost an inappropriate level of risk. It was good, what was now ULA, it was good for ULA. Right, because they became profitable, at least going forward, and it was good for Lockheed and Boeing. It turned out it was bad for the industry, right? Because what ended up happening is it launch got very expensive because at this time, like I said, we were launching four times a year rather than 40 or 10 or something like that. On an individual basis, these launches were expensive and it was a politically challenging for the government in part because they busted through their budgets. We had a, we had at least one non-McCurdy breach, which is what happens when you bust through a, a major defense program budget by a certain amount. You actually have to declare a, a breach to Congress and it's, it's all kinds of nasty stuff. It was not good for the Air Force. It wasn't really very good for Boeing and Lockheed politically. And so we had swung the pendulum, I would argue, way too far in the other direction. So we, we managed to get it wrong both ways with the ELB. So let's go to COTS. Let's go to COTS. Um, you know, when this started, I, I, there's somewhere in the, in the catacombs and archives um, is a of, um, C-SPAN is a presentation that I gave saying industry would be crazy to take on the level of risk that they were throwing at them with programs like COTS. Well, I was wrong. All right, you, you can put that one down. COTS actually had a pretty good balance of risk between government and industry. And, um, and then it went to CRS, which put a little bit more, a little bit more market risk, um, revenue risk on the government side, or took its revenue risk away from industry by guaranteeing, I think it was the initial tranche was 40 tons of up mass. And, and it, it, it worked out really well for SpaceX. I think, because it enabled them to actually build the Falcon 9 and lots of other good things. And I think financially, it was a pretty good program for SpaceX. Uh, for Orbital, it's less obvious how great a program it was. But I would say, uh, by and large, this is a program where we got it right. We got good capability. We got it at a good price. When the government sits back at the end of this, you know, it got two new launch vehicles. It got two new transfer vehicles. It got the basis for crew launch, it was a good deal for everybody, I think. So this is the case we got it right. And so of course, we're gonna copy exactly what we've done with this program with everything we're gonna do in the future because it's gonna be easy now. Okay, so we try commercial crew. Um, yeah, I, I am sure Phil McAllister would be throwing darts at me, probably throwing missiles at me for where I put this, but I think commercial crew put a lot of risk on on industry and the way it was. I mean, because they set it up more or less like COTS and CRS, but the way it was supposed to work is industry was going to propose its standards for human rating, government was going to accept those standards, and everything was just going to go forward like it went forward with, 
with COTS and CRS, only it just didn't really work that way. And it didn't work that way because the government has a legitimate need for deep insight into its astronauts and the safety of its astronauts. Um, NASA astronauts are not like commercial space passengers. They are different for, I mean, we can have this discussion for another hour, but they're, they're different and NASA cannot, and I don't think should not absorb that risk. Uh, and so they have to be hyper vigilant about safety. And what happens when you're hyper vigilant about safety is you require more and more um, uh, detailed analysis validating the safety of it. And when you were talking about detailed analysis, you're talking about time and money. And while NASA paid for the time and money for the detailed analysis, in the meantime, you've got a standing army that's supposed to be building these things that's chugging along at half speed, half speed in terms of making progress, full speed in terms of spending money, right? So it's a program that I, obviously it, did, it, it has not worked out very well for Boeing. And, and to be sure, a big chunk of that was self-inflicted, but nevertheless, you know, in, in the sort of classic shuttle era cost type contracts, that risk would have been borne primarily by the government. And Boeing took the hit and to their credit, they're, they are pressing on and they're gonna be launching again uh, the end of the month. Okay, but the point is, I think, I think, and this is a personal opinion, since I don't really have any institutions, I don't represent an institutional viewpoint, my personal opinion is we got it wrong here. Um, I really would like to, uh, I, I really need to talk to more people and, and, and determine what the perception was. The trouble is it's, it's sometimes in a program that's ongoing, it's hard to get honest opinions from people. Anyway, next thing up is clips. So absent some other factors, I would have put clips way up, way up here, because basically what, what, what the government said, what NASA said is, we want you guys to go build a spacecraft. We're not going to tell you if we're going to give, we're not going to reduce your market risk at all because we're not going to guarantee anything. We're, we are not going to pay for your development, but we'll buy missions from you maybe sometime in the future. And, and that would be absolutely insane were it not for the fact that a lot of these companies had already developed systems for the X Prize. So in some way, um, I don't know, Uncle Google. Well, nobody got paid for the X Prize stuff either, right? They'll, they'll, the investors lost at any rate. Nevertheless, so where we stand right now, Clips looks like right now from this point forward, I Clips is looking like a, it might be a pretty good deal. It might be a pretty good deal to get missions to the moon um, fairly cheaply. Just think about this, Surveyor. Surveyor, just the spacecraft alone in, in 2020 dollars or $600 million. And you had to put it on top of a rocket that was probably another $200 million. It's an almost a billion dollar program, right? And we are doing missions, CLIPS missions um, that are, I, I think we're talking 70 million delivered to the moon. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. So that's really encouraging. And then finally, so we talked about when we were bagging on EELV being all over the place. What I will say is now the space forces and industry, with Elon's help, to be sure, have got it about right. I think it's a good balance where that program stands right now, which is a good thing for everybody. Anyway, this whole diatribe was just to say we're all over the place. We really, um, I don't think we know what we're doing because I don't think we're thinking about risk sharing in methodical ways. I think you really have to segment. It's not just cost and revenue risk. There's a whole bunch of other things, but I think both sides have to understand what the other's risk profile is. And when you talk about going to the moon, you wanted to know how, when am I gonna get to the moon on this whole thing, right? When you talk about going to the moon and, and generating resources from the moon, it's a massively expensive program. It's a massively risky program. It's a massively long program. And so solving this, solving this risk problem is gonna be a huge deal. So first thing I wanna say that we all talk about technical risk, right? Cause we're space cadets and that's what we do. We talk about technology. The thing is, you know, when you get down to it we've had a lot of really smart people. This is a chart that was generated by some folks at Swamp Works at KSC. Um, and Rob Mueller, I think, put this together. So I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna take any credit for this, this is Rob's. But the point of it is, we understand the risk. We understand the pathway 
any one of these may turn out to be something which is really, really, really challenging, but we've got a pretty good handle on how to get from here to there. When you get to some of the other risks, the business and government risks, I don't know that we really have a handle on it. In fact, I think, I think we're, we are looking at it from opposite sides and in many ways, what government wants to reduce its risk is exactly what industry does not want. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of walk through a, a really crude risk burn down, um, risk burn down matrix. You got NASA on one side and you've got Luna Locks, our, our um, propellant depot company on the other. And we're just gonna, this is hopelessly simplistic, but I think it illustrates the point. So if you start, with, with one of the risks from industry's perspective is the risk is that development costs will exceed the plan and therefore you're not gonna have enough financing. And so what does industry want to reduce this? They want the government to pay for it. At the same time, you look at the government. And so they have a, they have a similar risk there, except it's really not, it's not exceeding plan, it's exceeding budget. And what they want is they want industry shared investment. They want industry to basically um, assume any cost overruns. And these things are antithetical to the two, right? They, they're just, they're talking past each other. It's not to say they can't agree on a negotiated solution, but they, it, it's, they, they got to understand that they're just, they're coming at it from different standpoints. Um, market risk, revenue risk from industry, insufficient demand. And so what industry wants from government for this, which is a perfectly reasonable thing. They want long-term anchor tenancy and they want a sole source contract. Well, the trouble is, you know, the government has a legitimate concern over supply. If you basically do, and of course we're hearing about this now, ironically enough from the contractors that didn't get selected, that the government shouldn't rely on just SpaceX to provide the human lander, human landing system. Um, the government should want multiple suppliers and they would. And we've done this with commercial crew, thankfully. We did it with uh, commercial resupply and it's worked out well. Um, the government is not going to be inclined to have a single supplier, certainly early on in the phase. They're gonna wanna have multiple suppliers if they've got to rely on these companies. Um, once you get to operations, again, you've got a cost risk. What the what industry is going to want is they're going to want the government to furnish the infrastructure for them. And government wants industry to rent the facilities for them, from them. And then finally, we get to some political risks, financing costs and availability. Industry wants government loan guarantees. Government hates loan guarantees. So here's where we end up. We're going to be yelling at each other. And until I think you know, my prescription is, is really to start the conversation between industry, government, and finance, as distinct from industry, right, to understand what's the pathway to burn down risk to the point where we can get to Lunalox Nirvana and bridge the chasm. But I think it really does take a lot of discussion about it, and it's not simply which technologies do we need to develop. Anyway, so um, that's my rant. And um, I, I think we can get there, but I think we gotta be smarter than we were in the past. And this is where we wanna to get to. This is what the next plaque needs to say instead of we came in peace for all mankind. <laughs> we came in profit for all mankind. Anyway, that's what I got. I love that. I, I wanna be that guy with that beer, although- uh, Yeah, but it's a Carlsberg. Uh, <laughs> you know- you can't, you can't go all the way to the moon to get a Carlsberg. <laughs> Seriously, it's gotta be it's gotta be a Colorado microbrew. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Anyway. All right. Thanks a lot, Andy.